Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. It's wonderful to see you all here today. We have a number of announcements as we get ready to join together for worship. First of all, I hope that you all saw in the bridge, there were a couple of things. As many of you may know, we are now uh, hosting the Coalition for Homelessness Outreach. Uh, it's a collaboration between Hamilton County government, the city government, and a number of nonprofits. They're housed downstairs. And they've asked us to partner with them by doing kind of an in-kind offering every month. <laughs> this month, they have asked us to do a collection of granola bars and tarps. And these will go directly into the tent cities where a number of our unhoused neighbors live. So I want to invite you all every Sunday to bring a tarp or a box of granola bars, and they will make uh, their way to help our neighbors who are struggling with housing and food insecurity and all of those sort of things. So, so please, uh, please keep that in mind, and we will keep, keep reminding you all about that opportunity. Um, also, you may have seen that we have a, a number of other opportunities to help provide service and prepare for our 150th. That is the sesquicentennial anniversary. You guys want to say that with me? Sesquicentennial, yeah, I love that word. Absolutely love that word. Um, we're doing a number of things. You may see Lindsay, the vi videographer, who is taking some um, uh, camera reel for uh, us. She's also going to be doing interviews. So if you have something to say about your time here, your experience, your history at First Christian Church, she is glad to do a little bit of an interview or one of those sort of short one word person on the street interviews. What do you love about uh, First Christian Church? Communion, snacks, music, whatever you want to say. She is, she is glad to grab you to do that. Um, there are also going to be Saturday work days to help get spruced up for the 150th uh, anniversary. So please take a, take a look at your calendars and see if there's a Saturday where you're, you would be available to come and, and help get ready for that. Also, our memory garden. We are planning on rededicating our memory garden. And if there is someone uh, dear to you, dear to this church that we have lost, and you have not been able to get a brick for them yet, those bricks are gonna be available, um, $100, $100, and we will have that person as part of our uh, community of saints that we remember in the garden as well. Uh, I am thrilled to introduce uh, to you all Reverend Allison Bright, who is a seminarian in her last semester at Bright Divinity School, which is part of Texas Christian University, a fine disciples institution, go frogs. And uh, she is going to be joining us in worship. There have been a number of opportunities that you all have had to meet her. And if you haven't had an opportunity to have a conversation with her, you will be able to do that after worship. We will be out on the pavilion. And so she will share kind of one more time her vision and a little bit about her. And it'd be a great opportunity for you all to introduce yourselves and uh, for her to get to know you all a little bit better. We are digging into Lent. This is the first Sunday of the Lenten season, and we are kind of coalescing as a community around one big question. What does it mean to be human? And so we're going to dig into the second creation story in the book of Genesis, and we're going to discover what might be in there for us to learn about what it means to be human made in the image of God and maybe a little bit dusty and dirty as well. So I invite you to bring who you are, all that you are created to be, to worship the God who creates us in love today.
I invite those of you who are able to please stand and join with me in our opening prayer and call to worship. God of deliverance and freedom, you talk about all of Israel to acknowledge that all things come from your bountiful hand. Deepen our faith so that we may resist temptation and, in the midst of trial, proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, now and forever. Amen. And I invite you to join with me in our children's blessing as we bless the children in this congregation, the children of our community, the children of our world, children we may know, and those who remain friends that we are yet to make. May God bless you and keep you. May God fill your heart with song and your mind with wisdom. May you learn every day how to be a disciple of Christ, to heal, to hope, to teach, and above all, to love. May you be our teachers, just as we are yours. You may be seated. I'd like to welcome Fielding Atchley, who is going to share a special recognition with us. Since I happen to be one of those who's been around these halls uh, since childhood, and we're not going to discuss this morning how long that's been, I've been honored by the current Board of Elders to make this special recognition. It is always uh, for another member of our church who's also been a lifetime member. It is always a very special occasion when one who has served us as elder is specially recognized for that service and the eldership in the other roles in the church and the community. I think it is even more so this morning because of the longevity and the quality and the variety of the service which our recipient has given to us in this community. To make this recognition, I want to share with you uh, the resolution that the Board of Elders submitted to uh, the Board for approval, which was unanimously passed, and which resolution was prepared by our own uh, Scott Cole. Today, I'm pleased to nominate our fellow laborer, B. Lines, for the honor of Elder Emerita. Be a longtime member of First Christian Church, merits this title, because of her faithful commitment to God, our Lord Jesus Christ, and his body, the church. Among us, be acquired and faithfully executed an extensive portfolio of duties. And while we know at least some of her resume, I'm happy to highlight a few of her accomplishments. For many years, B has served our church in a variety of capacities, including serving on the worship committee, where she organized volunteers to ensure reverent worship. Likewise, she ministered to our congregation to promote access to all, reminding us how the open ta table we celebrate extends beyond just our observance of communion. Also, B has become one of our beloved shepherds. Her life of faith equipped her for this tender vocation. Her sensitivity to others, ability to listen and organize, and her long tenure with our congregation have blessed First Christian Church beyond measure. Lastly, B's life as a disciple has benefited not only those within this church, but also those in our community. B's work as an educator, her, her advocacy for the hearing impaired, and her involvement in civic organizations have been informed by her faith journey, reflecting the love of Christ and the promises of his gospel to all who know her. Certainly her life of devotion to our church merits this recognition this morning. So please join me in affirming her work and conferring upon her this special honor. 
I think that a lot of you know that this is actually going to be B's last Sunday with us. She is moving uh, to be closer to her son, Franklin, uh, in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, which is just one of those things what happens when you need to be planning for the, quote, senior years. Uh, so B, um, as you go from us, on behalf of this congregation, we want to say, well done, our good and faithful servant and leader. We give thanks to the good Lord above for B. Lyons. Super quick things about B. First story that B ever told me was about how, as a child, when First Christian's building was on Georgia Avenue and this building was being built, she was brought over as a child and remembers just the huge sanctuary as it was being built and those tiny people that they were who got to, to witness that. And you know, the second thing that I will always remember about B is that whenever there was any sort of idea that I had as crazy as it might be, she said, you know, we'll try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a commentary or if that was a prayer, um, but <laughs> B, you have been part of this church as it has grown. You have helped in the growth of this church, you have nurtured so many of the people who have walked through the doors. You are a disciple in every sense of the word, and it is with great pleasure that I'm presenting you an Elder Emeritus pen that I hope that you will wear with pride and you will help continue to share the story of this place, this wider church, and the hope that comes through the gospel. Thanks to you, and thanks be to God for it. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis. And uh, if you have spent any time with Genesis, you know that there are two creation stories at the beginning. There is the, the days of the week creation story, and then there's the Garden of Eden. All of God's vastness, and they tell us slightly different things about who we are as God's created human race, what it means to be human beings. Uh, as we uh, started last week, I am reading a translation that is done by Will Gaffney, who is a professor at, at Bright Divinity School and has done a number of new translations that get to some of the nuances of the story. And you're going to hear what I like to say is kind of a dad joke. Uh, that's uh, woven into Genesis, a really interesting or maybe really bad pun. Uh, the, the name Adam, okay, which means human, is also a play on words with hadama, which is dirt or dust, okay? And so the way that it's translated here uh, kind of reflects that, human and humus, okay? So, you know, it's the holiest dad joke you will ever hear in your life. So. I invite you to open up your hearts, open up your minds, and listen for God's word in these words. The sovereign God crafted the human from the dust of the humus and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. And the human became a living soul. And the sovereign God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there, 
replaced the human whom God had formed. Now out of the ground, the sovereign God made grow every tree pleasant to the sight and good for food, and a tree of life in the middle of the garden, along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the sovereign God took the human and settled it in the garden of Eden to till and tend it. And then the sovereign God commanded the human, from every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Then the sovereign God said, it is not good that the human should be alone. I will make it someone to rely on as its partner. Then the sovereign God crafted from the humus every creature of the field and every bird of the skies and brought them to the human to see what it would call them. And whatever the human called every living soul, that was its name. The human gave names to all cattle and to birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the human, there was not found one to rely on as its partner. The sovereign God then caused a deep sleep to fall upon the human, and it slept. Then it took one of its sides and closed up its place with flesh in place of it. And the sovereign God built that side that had been taken from the human into a woman and brought her to the human. And then the human said, this time, this one is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called a woman, for out of a man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his mother and his father and clings to his woman, and they become one flesh. And they were, the two of them, naked, the woman and her man, and were not ashamed. This is the word of God. What does it mean to be human? That's a question that this story has inspired in a variety of ways. You see on the cover of your bulletin an illustration artist Mark Chagall did of this very story to kind of play with the themes, imagine the beauty of Eden, imagine what creation of humanity might have looked like. You may have heard a a teaching on this story that says this is the very beginning of sin. This is where humanity strayed from God's good plan and became awful and in need of really big help. There are a number of questions that emerge from this story and they, so many of them converge on that big question. What does it mean? There's the part of it that is kind of a a just-so story. You know, those stories that are meant as fables to kind of explain how we do things. You get it to the end of, of this chapter, and you kind of hear it in those last couple of verses. Well, this story was all about telling you why a man leaves his family and, and takes a woman and they get married. That's what this story is about. That's what it means to be human. Maybe. Maybe that's part of it. But there are lots of things going on in this story that tell us what it means to be a human being. And the first one is this. We are deeply connected to all of creation. Humans out of the humus. We are created from that very stuff that gives birth to trees, to flowers, to oxygen and the carbon dioxide cycle. We are part of that and deeply connected, so connected that that which is atomic is also reflected in what we are. We are deeply connected into everything that God creates. We are part of it. 
The second thing that we hear in the story about it, what it means to be human, is that we are deeply connected to one another. The way that Gaffney tells this story may be a little different than you've heard it previously. There was a human that was created, and that human was split into two. And you begin with one, and at the end you begin with man and woman. And they are two sides of the same coin. They are the ends of a spectrum. They are people who share a simple, same beginning. We are deeply connected to one another. No matter where we find ourselves, no matter who we understand ourselves to be, no matter how we articulate what it means to be me in my skin or you in your skin, we share that same origin. The Human Genome Project decided in its research that we are 99.9% genetically identical. Our difference across ethnic, racial, gender, all of those differences is 0.1%. We are deeply, deeply connected to one another. And the last thing that this story kind of gets at in terms of what it means to be human is this. We need each other. We are lonely when it is only us. It is that 0.1% of difference that makes up community, that connects us in our difference because you can talk in a mirror all day long, but you can't be in community with the reflection in the mirror. Oneness does not mean sameness. And we, as a community of one, are made up of different people who need one another, who complement one another, who are part of the beautiful spectrum of God's good creation. This story tells us we are deeply connected to all of creation. We are deeply connected to one another, and we need one another. Needing one another takes many forms, and just last week I heard a story of a Catholic journalist who was finishing up her day's work, and the reports of the violence in Ukraine were peaking and coming in fast and overwhelming everyone in the newsroom. And she knew she had one thing to do. She drove three towns over to a little church that she remembered, a Ukrainian Catholic church full of immigrants who shared a version of her faith, who prayed slightly different accented prayers, who welcomed her in, who announced their hopes and intentions for the time of prayer during that vigil, that their relatives, their extended community back home might be safe. And she joined these people who were alike, yet different, in prayer. And at the end of the service, a woman who had been seated off to the right and up towards the front, wearing a headscarf, stood up and addressed the entire congregation. She, too, was a stranger. And she said, you may have noticed, and she gestured to her family, we are Muslim. We came here because we were worried about you. And we saw the sign for the vigil. 
And we knew, though our language, though our faith, though our tradition is so different, that we needed to be with you, connected to you, part of you, humans from the humus. We are called to be many, many things, friend. We are called primarily, though, to be part of God's good creation, to be intimately connected to one another and to be there for one another because each of us needs the other. Dusty and made of humus, though we may be. Thanks be to God. We share in our joys and concerns together this morning. We hold the family of former Minister of Visitation here at FCC, Robert Bob Childress, in prayer. Bob died last week. There will be a visitation for him at the Chattanooga Funeral Home in the North Chapel from 4 to 7 p.m. today. And his funeral will be at 11.30 tomorrow, also at North Chapel Funeral Home. Betty Proctor was in a car accident on Thursday night, and so we continue holding her in prayer. And she suffered many broken ribs and a broken leg, as well as several other injuries. She had a successful surgery on Friday, and we rejoice with the news that she continues to make good progress. We celebrate with Jonathan and Kirsten Hyde as they brought their new daughter, Lucy Rivers Hyde, home from the hospital. 
There are health challenges ahead for Lucy, but we rejoice because so far she is doing remarkably well. I also thank you for your hospitality this weekend. You have truly shown me what it means to welcome a stranger. Will you join with me now in a time of prayer? Giver of the breath of life, you hold all of the sand of the earth and allow no single grain to slip through from your gaze or your grasp. You know the names of species we have yet to discover. Like sand that is always accounted for and species known and named only by you, we too gather from scattered places as your people, equally counted among your beloved and fully named and known by you. With the same breath of life you gave to animate us, we confess that you are worthy of endless praise, and holy is your name. Shaper of our bodies, we are your people of dirt and water and breath. Of all beautiful things that came from your hands, a universe, a world, an ecology, you looked upon us with awe and amazement too deep for words miraculously holy, breathtakingly beautiful, unquestionably yours. All humankind, no exceptions, no imperfections, and no two just the same. And yet you call us all beloved just as we are. May we learn to look at our bodies as lovingly as you, seeing our roles and wrinkles not as flaws, but as the very body that you shaped and lovingly looked upon with tear-filled awe. Reminding us of the beloved, the embodiment of your covenant, the aspiration of our lives, Jesus the Christ. Sacred Maker, we pray for a warring world and all who are vulnerable in it, we don't pretend to know the extent of the damages or what tomorrow will bring for the people of Russia and Ukraine. But we know that you are a God of peace and that we cannot bomb our way to shalom. We trust that you made us in your image to live in community and peace with our neighbors. And so we seek your wisdom as we move back and forth from prayer to action, to prayer, back to action. Hear us now as we join our voices together in the prayer your son taught us to pray. Our creator who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. <coughs> And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will the presiding elders please come forward. hospitable. It is also no easy thing to be a stranger. They're both a little bit scary. Being hospitable leaves you vulnerable. Being a stranger does that too. But luckily, this is a place that knows no stranger. You never have to come here and wonder if God will know you if God will look lovingly upon you. For every person, every time that you come to this table, God looks at you and says, hello, beloved. It's good to see you again. Jesus took his closest friends, gathered in an upper room, 
and in sharing a meal together, he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks for it and blessed it, and he said, he said, this is the cup, this is the bread of God. And he broke it and shared it with them. Likewise, after the supper, he took a cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Each time that you gather to eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do so in the memory. Will you join me now in the litany found in your bulletin? And the table will be wide, and the welcome will be wide, and the arms will be wide open to gather us in, and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough, and we will come unhindered and free, and our aching will be met with bread, and our sorrow will be met with wine. As we come to, to your table this morning, holy God, to receive these elements in remembrance of how Christ's body was given for us, save us from unworthy participation. In this season of self-examination, help us to be honest with ourselves about any areas in our lives where we are not living up to your expectations. Help us to follow you and to care for one another during this holy season of Lent. In Jesus' name we pray. Having all been served, all called by name, beloved, join me now in partaking in our elements.
Lord, at every trip to this table, we seek from this small meal a great renewal. We want to be filled good, again with love, peace, grace, and hope. Not for our selfish, selfish satisfaction, but so that we may truly live by following the loving servant way of your son, Jesus. We cannot help but give thanks for this never-ending provision and humbly pray that with your help and guidance, we will be renewed. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Out into the rest of the world. First of all, I am absolutely thrilled to be able to welcome the Pringle family officially as members. They have been worshiping with us for two years now, two pandemic-ridden years, and we are grateful for your presence uh, among us. Uh, Alex uh, is part of the Pringle family as well, and he worships with us uh, virtually via Facebook. So we welcome you, Alex, we welcome Kim, and we welcome Hannah and Evan. Uh, Alex works as a copier tech uh, for ACT Business Machines, and Kim works as a school principal for Hamilton County Schools. And Hannah is 11, and Evan is 8, and both of them enjoy very Chattanooga things, reading and hiking in their free time. So, Pringle family, we are so grateful to count you among us and are glad that you are part of this community. Thanks be to God. And I also want to remind you that next week after worship, we have a very, very important congregational meeting with a very, very important vote that we are going to be taking. So please uh, be here for that meeting. If you cannot make that meeting or if you know someone who, again, you know, we are still in the red zone here in Hamilton County in terms of COVID. If you know folks who don't feel comfortable, please have them be in touch and we will also uh, be sharing a way that folks who want to worship virtually can also participate in that meeting as well. So they will hear about that uh, this week. And uh, also do remember all of those announcements for the ways to keep busy and help prepare us for the 150th. What's the word for 150th again? Sesquicentennial. I love it. Absolutely. All right. I bring you a benediction that I hope someday your children know by heart as I do, to always have a little piece of home with them. Will you repeat each line after me? May the words I speak today, speak today hurt, no hurt no one in any way. And if I say what is not true, say what is not help, me say I'm sorry too. help me say I'm sorry too. Help me feel what others feel. Help me, feel help me learn to love and heal. Help me always do my part to bring joy to another's heart. Go now in peace.